Hello, everyone. My name is Nidia Cordova, and I'm the Alumni Relations Manager at the CUNY School of Professional Studies. Um, I also lead the celebration activities in honor of CUNY Tuesday, which is today at CUNY SPS. The activities include fundraising for student emergency funds and scholarships, as well as organizing this wonderful career panel, which we have planned for you this evening. Um, I would like to start by welcoming you, our amazing students, alumni, staff, faculty, foundation board members, donors, and guests to this year's CUNY Tuesday celebration at the CUNY School of Professional Studies. If you have already made a gift in support of our students, thank you so much. If you would like to donate, there is still time to do so. Um, and if you can, and you can also become a fundraiser by creating your own page to help us spread the word. To make a gift or for more information, please visit sps.cuny.edu backslash CUNY Tuesday. This year's CUNY Tuesday panel discussion is called Maximize Your Transferable Skills for Success in a Remote Work Environment. And it includes expert panelists who will offer advice on adapting and thriving in any work setting, building sought after skills to function effectively while remaining flexible and goal-driven. We also have time for Q&A with our panelists towards the end of the program. Before getting started, I just wanna take a moment to thank our amazing career services team. It's just wonderful collaborating with you. Um, they have helped organize what promises to be an interesting panel discussion. Um, I also want to thank Christian Cardenas and Raul Rosario who will provide technical support for this evening. Um, so just a couple of things before we get started. Please select speaker view option at the top right corner of your Zoom screen. And please note that this event is being recorded and all attendees will receive a link afterwards. Um, and now I would like to turn the event over to Nadine Martin, who will be your moderator for this evening. Nadine is a CUNY SPS Foundation board member and associate director for oncology global marketing at Merck. Nadine brings over 20 years of marketing strategy and advertising experience from both healthcare and consumer brands. Thank you so much, Nadine, for your work as the CUNY SPS Foundation board member and for agreeing to moderate the discussion for this evening. Please take it away, Nadine. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Nydia. Thank you for the introduction and also for just allowing me to be a part of this wonderful event. I know that we will all learn a lot tonight. So without any further delay, let's jump right in. I would now like to introduce our speakers for this evening. First, Don Anuzianwu is a fellow CUNY SBS Foundation Board member and a senior director on the structured finance team with White Oak Merchant Partners where he focuses on deal origination and transaction structuring and execution. Previously, Don worked at Morgan Stanley and several other large financial institutions. His professional background includes concentrations in investment banking, client coverage, leveraged finance credit, private credit, and structured capital placements. Earlier, Don served as a captain in the U.S. Army and was decorated with the Bronze Star Medal for meritorious service while deployed in support of combat operations in Iraq. Next, Ebony Wilkins is a CUNY SPS alum of the MS in uh, program in business management and leadership program. She is the CEO and principal consultant of Inclusive Media Solutions, LLC. Ebony has provided significant editorial support in-house and remote to small, business, to small businesses, nonprofit organizations, and government uh, agencies, including the City of New York. Ebony built a career in media activism as a social justice writer and editor shaping media through the lens of inclusion. And then we have Bronwyn Stein, who joined CUNY SBS as the Assistant Dean of Information Technology back in 2019, shortly before the COVID-19 pandemic. As an information technology leader with more than 20 years experience in commercial uh, performing arts and educational markets, Brownman has fostered nimble and inclusive tech workspaces in person and online. 
So welcome to all our wonderful speakers. Thank you so very much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be part uh, of this this evening. Thank you, Nadine. So I just wanted to reiterate a couple of housekeeping uh, points. Please send your questions via the chat feature to our hosts, Nidia and Shannon. They will keep track of all your questions. And I will ask our speakers uh, for their thoughts after the discussion. To get a sense of how our attendees are feeling this evening, we have two poll questions for our audience. Here's the first question. Does your current role offer remote options or a flexible schedule? Mm, let me see. Yes or no? Okay. Oh, we're, we're starting with the statistics. Sorry. Oh, okay. That's fine. I can, I can head over to the statistics. Um, so we took a look at uh, some statistics uh, regarding remote work from a McKinsey survey conducted earlier this year. Uh, it sampled 25,000 adults aged 18 and older living in the U.S. Here are just a couple of questions from the survey. The first one you've seen here, uh, does your current role offer remote options? And uh, we're, we're seeing here. All right, Nydia, should we end the poll? Yes. Okay, so we see here that um, the majority, 80%, um, uh, have, have remote options, which are great, 20% uh, no. Okay. All right. That's great. The second one, are you, uh, let's go to the second question. Are you currently seeking employment? Okay, this is great. This gives us uh, the temperature in the room. Yeah, we're looking at the majority seem to be seeking employment, 63% so far are not, 22% are, 15% still deciding. Okay, we'll wrap it up there with 63% not currently seeking employment, 22% are. So as I was mentioning, we took a look at these statistics from the McKinsey survey and um, would love to share a couple of them with you tonight. The first statistic is what percentage among employed um, what percentage among the employed would prefer to to uh, the option to work remotely a 22 percent b 56 percent or c 87 percent all right we'll reveal that answer So the answer to that poll is actually 87%. So in this McKinsey survey, among employed residents, given the option to work remotely, 87% uh, took employers up on that offer. The results of the survey show that not only is flexible work popular, but many want to work remotely for much of the week uh, when given the choice, with over 40% of respondents uh, choosing to work four or more days remotely. All right, the second statistic is among survey responses, the opportunity for flexible um, work mainly differs by occupation and role, true or false? All right, I see the answers pouring in. Okay, it looks like 88% of you answered true, and that's correct. The opportunity to work flexibly differs by industry and role within industries and has implications for companies um, competing for talent. 
For example, half of respondents working in educational instruction and library occupations and 45% of healthcare practitioners and workers in technical occupations say that uh, they do some work uh, remotely, perhaps reflecting the rise uh, of online uh, education, of course, and telemedicine. So thank you very much for participating in those, um, in those polls. Uh, now that the, uh, we're all warmed up, I think what I'll do is I'll begin to turn to our uh, esteemed speakers and start with some questions around best practices and tips. So Ebony, if I could start with you, how do you report in while working in a remote or hybrid environment? Um, for example, progress reports or, you know, goal status, um, meeting and project statuses. Thank you for that question. I think that the primary thing to remember is that communication is going to be paramount. If people can't see you or put their hands on you, you need to communicate so that people um, don't have to pretend that they're mind readers. So for example, if you're setting a meeting or you're in charge of a meeting, you should set an agenda um, by email in advance. Um, that way people can know if they need to be at the meeting, um, what's going to be discussed, they can have an idea of what's going on. Um, you should also update your calendar to um, let people know of your availability. So do you protect your lunchtime very you know, fiercely? People need to know that. Um, do you have to leave early on Wednesdays to go pick up your kid? People, you know, should respect that as well. So keeping an updated calendar is another good way. Um, knowing um, the best ways to reach you is also really important. So you might want to put that in your email signature, like um, if you want people to be able to schedule meetings with you and you have a day set aside for that, put a link for people to schedule in there so there's no back and forth. And for any collaboration tools that your organization might use, you wanna know what the features are on them. So for example, if um, you're using Microsoft Teams and you have focus time that you really need to get a deadline done, you might want to put up do not disturb or busy and that lets everyone else know that you know your time is protected for that period of time so they're all different ways to communicate but as long as you're actually letting people know when you're available how they can reach you and um the best ways for them to communicate with you everything becomes a lot easier no those are some great tips thank you so very much Don, moving over to you, what do you recommend are the best ways to stay present with colleagues and leadership while working in a remote or hybrid role? Um, networking tips or uh, how best to collaborate? Sure, Nadia, uh, thanks for that question. And um, also uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, super excited to be part of the panel here. And um, Nadia and Nadia, thank you for uh, you know, sparing and organizing. Um, very poignant questions indeed, um, particularly in you know in this work environment post COVID, uh, and COVID has actually introduced or was a trigger for what I call transformative and disruptive technologies that are certainly at our disposal, right? So Ebony mentioned Teams, Zoom. There's a plethora of you know net, uh, tools that we can use to stay visible, over communicate, um, and so to particularly stay present. Um, on your team, if you are engaged in a capacity where you're working remotely, I think is of paramount importance, right? So the techniques that I use on a personal basis, particularly for the times when I'm traveling out of the office or just working remotely, I have a five-year-old son, He's always, you know, I, I want to say every month or so, he's always bringing back some cough or cold from school, right? So, and we have to either quarantine or just deal with, you know, something in that regard. So, um, set meetings, uh, uh, everybody to sort of tag along to the, you know, ideas that you put forth on a weekly basis. Just have a weekly catch up meeting. I, I find Monday mornings work best. Um, and so you can get folks on your team um, to participate in those meetings. Um, so that's at the start of the week. Uh, toward the end of the week, on a Thursday, Thursdays tend to work pretty well. Send an email summary for what you've accomplished that week, right? So that the email is backward looking 
basically spells out to your team, to your supervisors and manage up and down and laterally as, as the case may be, um, specify exactly what you've accomplished for that week and then give a leadway, you know, basically a continuum into the following week as to what your objectives and goals are on the path or the plan that you have to actually um, accomplish those, uh, those, those key deliverables. <clears throat> and I think networking is also very important, particularly in the hybrid role. Um, just introduce yourself to folks, make sure people know you get on their calendars, you know, have a virtual coffee, get together or, or what have you, if you will. Um, apologies for the long with it, uh, you know, answer there, but, you know, and also being in a hybrid uh, um, virtual role, there, there's a spectrum to it, right? Some folks are full-time remote, some folks are just part-time. So when you are in the office, as the case may be, make sure that you are visible, people know you, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll just pause there. No, Don, those are all some really great tips. As, as a person who has been working either flexibly or remote for the past seven years, I, I just want to underscore how important it is when you are heading into the office to make time and plan for time to meet with people, um, to meet face to face or just to even just check in face to face when you get a chance. Um, I think those are all great tips. Thanks, Don. And uh, Brahman, I'm so happy that uh, you're here with us because you can tell us all about um, some new, perhaps there's some new ways of communicating um, beyond Zoom that uh, we could take advantage of. Sure. Uh, thank you, Nadine, for that question. And thanks to everybody for having me here. Um, it's an honor to get to talk to our students uh, and our alums and everyone else in our community here at CUNY SPS. Um, I think that when we're work working remotely and we're thinking about what tools we use to communicate, we really can't lose track of the fact that, that our goal, the way we're gonna be effective in our jobs is to connect with people in a genuine human way. And for a lot of people, this comes naturally uh, when we're in person. Um, you have all of these, uh, we have all of these ways that we subtly connect with each other whether it's body language or tone. And sometimes the tools that we use in, in a remote capacity uh, may not naturally facilitate uh, that kind of connection. So um, my recommendation is to really layer on the ways that you're communicating with your colleagues and your customers um, and use all the tools and use them together, right? So. Of course, we have Zoom and Teams and Google Meet if we're going to be doing uh, any type of web meeting, like sort of like we're doing today. But of course, there's also email and there's Slack. There's your project management tools, Monday.com, Basecamp, Asana. And, and also there's our telephone, right? Sometimes it's great to pick up the phone, old school, give somebody a call. Um, and then as just to, uh, you know, build on what Ebony and Donatus already said, um, make time occasionally to meet people in person if at all possible. Um, because uh, one of the things I've found in this age of multiple layers of communication tools is that when we do get together in person now, um, we've already taken care of the business, right? <laughs> For the most part, the business kind of belongs in those tools. And when we get together in person, uh, we can really enjoy each other, uh, enjoy each other's company. And um, so that's that's my recommendation is to layer those, those tools together. A lot of times you can make them work together. And, um, and that's, that's what I think. Oh my goodness, that's that's such great that's such great advice, and I I love what you said about the business. We'll keep the business in the tools, and then we can just enjoy one another when we um, are actually face to face again. Thank you so very much. Um, so I'm gonna turn now to maybe perhaps some questions around the current climate and some trends. Uh, Ebony, I'll start with you. Um, how can we identify a remote or flexible job opportunity? What details do you look for in a job posting? That's a great question. And the short answer is it's tricky. <laughs> um, a lot of employers have learned to put remote to sort of catch people um, who are interested in that, but you have to read the posting carefully to understand what the nuances are. 
So for example, um, some something might say fully remote, then um, some might say hybrid, some might say, um, you know, ad hoc. Um, it really depends. And it's really important, especially if you're looking for something fully remote to pay attention to the details. So for example, um, I've seen postings that say, um, this is a remote position, but you have to live in the state of California or you have to live in the Northeast or you have to be willing and able at your own expense to travel to Washington, DC. So it really depends on um, what it says. And I would advise you unofficially, of course, to be very careful um, about the roles that say where you need to be in a specific state. So if you live in Connecticut and it says that the role is you have to be in New York, do not lie about that. There are um, insurance workplace things that have to be in place in order to protect you and employers have to have those ducks in a row in order for you to work remotely in certain states. And so do not ignore those things and say, he, 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 I can just <laughs> do something else. It, it's for your protection, really. So just be mindful of what the job posting says and take it to heart. If they say you can only be in these five states, know that they really mean that for liability reasons. Well, that's that's a good point. Honesty is always the best policy, right, Ebony? Um, so Don, um, if I can turn to you and ask, what can we expect to see in the job market given current the current economic climate and trends across different career fields? Sure, <clears throat> and I'll caveat my answer by saying that um, I know that on this particular you know forum there are probably folks of different uh, who work in different industries. Um, so my response to, my response to your question is sort of a broad stroke. It's, it's certainly generalized. Um, However, you know, coming from my vantage point, uh, where I work in the securities industry, um, certainly in a business environment, and, you know, I'm also sensitive to folks who work, for example, in healthcare and education, because I, fa I have family members who work in such fields and different capacities related there, too. Um, what I would say is just there are lots of headwinds from a macro perspective, right? So a lot of employers are grappling with challenges coming from the top down. Um, and so that's impacting budget in many different uh, you know, varieties and capacities, right? So we, we all see it in the public domain, large employers in the tech sector um, um, have you know, very recently executed massive layoffs, right? And that's just one subsector. Um, and in my sector, obviously we are, we are impacted because it is a, a direct, impact from what happens in a broader business, uh, business environment. And even also in healthcare, you see it. I mean, these are all, you know, companies that have PNL um, that they have to cater to. Um, so it is reverberated throughout the broader economy. Um, so for, for employees, effectively what that means is this is time to bring your A game, right? Particularly as we get towards year end, depending on industry that you're in. Um, and for folks who are working hybrid remote, my you know, my thoughts are, I think it's all the more challenging, right? Because there is a tendency to, for you know, out of physical touch, out of mind, out of sight. Um, it certainly makes it a little bit more complex. So, um, so I think the onus is on those folks who are working in some sort of hybrid, remote, virtual capacity to um, over communicate, be over present. If you have the opportunity to actually come into the office, and if, to the extent that it doesn't disrupt any, you know, anything that, um, any conditions that anyone is dealing with, um, I would say it's probably worth the effort, um, worth the while to, 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 to undertake that. Um, be in front of your manager. You know, I know, for example, reviews are going on right now at the banks, um, and I'm sure it's happening across industry as well. Um, you know, the budget for next year is being uh, set <laughs> currently. So be present, be over communicative, make sure that you are in that pool of folks who want to be kept on. Um, um, because, you know, from what I'm hearing, certainly in, you know, in the markets, broader industry, I think um, there are certain economic headwinds that are still to come. Um, but, you know, there is also... Um, a bit of optimism on, on the horizon where 
again, from the top down, maybe economic conditions will ease, interest rates will start to come back, the Fed will pivot, that'll just, you know, create uh, some cushion for, you know, captains of industry to basically, you know, steer the ship in a different way, where they may not be as uh, punitive in terms of headcount reductions um, and the like. Yeah. No, I think those are all uh, important points for us to keep in mind, especially as the year draws to a close, um, perhaps over indexing on some of those tips that the panelists, um, uh, you know, uh, shared with us earlier about communicating with your team, uh, sharing progress reports and also making time, whether virtually or in person to check in with leadership or other people within your team. I think that those are all great points. Thank you, Don. Yeah. Brown. How do we stay current on technology and the new software? And why is it important for us to, to stay current? I, I do want to say that from my point of view in uh, working in IT, uh, just to, to um, kind of segue from Don's point about the economy, we are still seeing very uh, heavy demand in certain fields like IT. And, um, you know, there was there was a uh, 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 there are, of course, people uh, back on the job market after those big tech layoffs, but um, but in general, uh, I do still see heavy demand in in, uh, in IT and tech fields. Um, but to answer your question, Nadine, so w what ways do you stay current and, yeah. uh, with new cool. software? Um, be curious. Be curious. You're not going to break anything, right? <laughs> Play with the software. Um, I always tell people, click that waffle menu. Always click the, wa click the waffle. Do we know what the waffle is, right? It's, it's those nine dots in a, in a square formation. Always click the waffle menu. Always click the hamburger. The hamburger is the three lines, one on top of each other. Always click the kebab. That's the three dots. Always click them. You can't break it. Just try it out. Give it a try. Um, get nosy with your colleagues ask them how they're doing things and and why they're doing it get nosy with your kids you know how are you doing this thing uh, you know my daughter learned to uh, whip up a powerpoint in middle school and i think you're you know many people's kids <laughs> you can relate um there's also just so many resources out there you can google anything you can YouTube anything. You can learn how to do anything on, on YouTube. I know uh, lots of us have been surprised by um, the obscure things you can learn to do on YouTube. You just have to search it. Um, I do have some recommendations for newsletters. Uh, Morning Brew does a daily newsletter that is very breezy, easy to get through, and usually includes um, you know, technology tips and tricks. Um, our own Graduate Center uh, resource here uh, at CUNY, Jeremy Kaplan, he heads the, um, the um, academic instruction group over there, and he puts out a great newsletter on uh, Substack called Wonder Tools. Uh, so check out Jeremy Kaplan's Wonder Tools on Substack, and then take advantage of that time on the, uh, during your commute when you might not otherwise be productive, uh, listen to podcasts. There's Slate's um, ICIMY. There's the Better Life Lab on Slate. The Morning Brew also has podcasts, Business Casual. And then, so those are kind of the in the environment ways of learning, but you can also seek out more formal online uh, learning on LinkedIn Learning, Masterclass, um, Khan Academy, and, and YouTube, like I said before. No, those are great. And I believe that you um, will share those links with Nydia, who will include it when this uh, recording goes out to everyone in case they weren't as, uh, as fast as, <laughs> as they wanted to be with their pencils. So thank you very much for that. And how do you, you know, how do you characterize why it's important that we stay current? Sure. Well, um, like I said, the employers are really counting on people coming to the job with um, with technology skills, the basics, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, email, um, and some collaboration tools these days as well. Um, they're expecting that. They're not, uh, they're not training that, <laughs> you know. Um, so for those of us who have been in the workplace for, for a little while, um, I think we, we just need to, to be aware that, that that's the, an expectation that's been in transition for a long time, and we need to keep up with it. 
No, that's that's a great point. It is the expectation <laughs> in the end <laughs> that we do stay current. And I and I loved your tip to stay curious. Um, I think that takes the intimidation factor out of it. Absolutely. Um, so now we'll move uh, over to some general industry overview questions. And Ebony, if I could start with you. Um, do you think that flexible work schedules are just a trend born out of the pandemic? Um, maybe we'll start there with that question. I don't think that it's a trend. I think that some employers would hope it's a trend. <laughs> um, maybe because they want you to buy $14 salads at lunch. But um, <laughs> but um, it's, it's definitely not a trend. Um, I mean, if you think about it, if it were truly a trend, we would not be smacked with so many different kinds of tools to facilitate online collaboration. I mean, the the proof is there. Um, the proof yeah. is there. Really. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's true. So um, in your experience, what specific industries are you aware of um, that offer or that are pretty consistently looking uh, to offer flexible schedules and which are not? I think that places that offer flexibility, um, it's sort of a moving target. I think that a lot of places who are looking for in-person um, do so and they might start to switch to remote or hybrid if they're unsuccessful at finding a candidate that um, meets their needs. A lot of places are looking for unicorns. I hate that term, but <laughs> they're looking for people who can do all the things all the ways and um, and still in their own you know, hometown or wherever the headquarters is located. There are plenty of jobs that you just can't do remotely. I mean, I don't think anybody would appreciate a firefighter who is remote. Like, it's just not going to work, you know? Um, you know, while telemedicine is is great and extremely useful and is here to stay, there are some times when you just need someone to actually look at you. I mean, you also can't do an MRI remotely, right? Uh, so there are just some, there are some industries and some professions that there is no replacement for. I mean, like, if you look at education, that's a little bit different because you have plenty of online schools, um, even for K through 12, you have plenty of those, but those benefit primarily people who can oversee their children at home. There are still plenty of people like, as we learned through the pandemic, first responders and um, essential workers who they have to have their kids someplace in order for them to go to work. So, yeah. you know, it's it's really it really depends on so many factors. But um, and e even though some organizations or some industries might think that their job can't be done remotely, there there are also organizations out there who are willing to try and see if it works. And sometimes they're successful. And then that starts a new pathway for people to um, take something i mean telemedicine had to start somewhere right, right. Mm -hmm. someone someone had to say you know maybe the doctor can look at my rash through the computer <laughs> maybe they don't actually have to touch it so it i think it's fluid and it's changing all the time and mm -hmm. so there's always an option though that you know you can create the role that you want by going into business for yourself if <laughs> you find that you have right. skills um that are not being utilized the way that um, would benefit you the most. So you always have options. No, that's a great point. Options are a great point. Don, I just I want to maybe get you to weigh in on this question as well. Um, do you have anything to add uh, to which industries may be less inclined to offer flexible work schedules? Um, I, I certainly agree with Ebony. Um, I, I think um, for the most part, there are certain industries that are amenable to, uh, you know, folks who want to work in a virtual remote capacity. Obviously, there are some that cannot accommodate it. I, I, Ebony, your, your example spot on. You can't be a five out of work remotely, right? That, that doesn't work. Um, however, I, I think, you know, the, the start point of that from, an, from the employee perspective is really to have that conversation from, 
from from the you know interview per point, right? So if you first off, you have to be strategic about how you go about looking for that next opportunity. Um, uh, from a personal perspective, I've always found networking, making use of folks I know internally, um, to be you know the the, the the most efficient path, right? Like having someone internally actually push your resume. And if you can actually do it from the top down, right? If you have a senior person who can be your advocate, um, it's a different conversation than having someone junior who has to push it upwards, right? Um, so, so if you have that that level of connected connectivity, it's always great. But if you, at the very least, just having someone internally, and LinkedIn is such a powerful tool because you can always find someone like one or two degrees removed uh, who you can leverage through school, whatever. Um, so I think that's always great, just being strategic about that. And so if you're strategically inclined, then you can find those industries or particular roles that suit your uh, current condition in terms of, you know, finding that flexibility between being in the office or being full-time remote or a hybrid of the two. Um, so th th those are my thoughts there. Yeah, no, I think those are great. And um, you actually already started to address my next question, which was how you plan you know, how would you plan for success um, in a flexible schedule if you were changing jobs and careers? And you did talk about LinkedIn and using your um, using your networks, um, which I think are so important. And maybe we're, we're less likely to to remember our school network, which is great here at CUNY SPS or, um, you know, just other networks, um, you know, just reach out, talk to people, have the conversation. Anything else you wanted to, to add to that? Um, um, I mean, it's it's always tricky. Again, depending on the industry, what company that you work for. Some industries, um, it's much easier to transition into a new role while you're in a current role. Um, you know, for example, my sister is a nurse practitioner, and when she moved from New York to 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 uh, Pennsylvania, it was relatively easy for her, right? Like, it's not like you have to sneak out of the office and have come, you know, have conversations, and you have an hour before your boss gets back from another meeting asking you where you've been. So, different sets of challenges. Um, so, but if you're in a situation where it's dicey, you have to have presence, but not let folks know that you're interviewing until you've gotten that offer letter and you pass background check, and now you can disclose it, then that's a whole different dynamic that you have to certainly deal with. So again, I think just being strategic, um, being efficient, but also just making sure that that move is the right move because the grass always looks green on the other side. Um, so, uh, but it, it, and interestingly enough, actually being in a virtual situation or hybrid remote situations that I mean, actually facilitates that right because then you can have conversations without you know interrupting the office dynamic um so that is something to actually be be, be cognizant of because if it's if you're in a situation where and some folks admittedly so want to be in a situation or a particular role for maybe three to five years at a time and they look for something new or maybe even shorter and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that um you want you want to find that position that will allow you such flexibility right but um you don't want to have the new prospective position that's not locked up um basically jeopardize your current situation yeah no i think that's, that's uh, very important to remember Thank you for that. And uh, Bronwyn, when, what has happened to training for new products? <laughs> like, how do we find an employer, an employer who actually provide training? Right. Well, you know, this is really interesting. The, the way that software has been produced over the last five years or so has really undergone a pretty dramatic uh, change. Whereas in the past, you know, a, a software company would produce a, a piece of software and then they would roll it out, right? And that would be the end of it and you would learn how to use it. Uh, that's not really the way it works anymore. It's uh, the um, agile development uh, revolution, I guess, has, has put us in a place where uh, the software comes out and then it continually changes and evolves. So uh, from an employer's point of view, it's, it's almost impossible to put together a training program that's going to continue to be relevant and uh, and provide um, their employees with the exact way to do this or that. So uh, fortunately, software these days is 
lot more intuitive, right? And the conventions are starting to develop there. Um, the waffle menu, the kebab, and the hamburger, like I was saying, um, the the overall goal of, of software developers today is to uh, is to let you use the tool without having to think about it too hard. Um, now, if you are working either in a very specialized industry uh, where there has to be purpose-built software, um, or maybe you're working in a very, very large institution where uh, software upgrades uh, don't happen as easily or as often um, as they do out in the uh, private sector, like you may have a very non-intuitive piece of software that you have to use. And in those cases, um, the employer will almost always uh, provide some training for that. But but really, I think it's it's going to trend more and more this direction that we're all going to have to hone our um, our intuition and our and our comfort with being curious, like I said before, playing with the software and uh, learning how to use it through experimentation. No, I think I think that's great. And, you know, what I'm hearing from all of you is that, you know, this this theme that we do have to be strategic, we do have to read the fine print, right, Ebony? Um, we need to be curious um, and purposeful in in our job search if that, you know, this is a scenario that we're we're looking to find. And also, how do we best arm ourselves um, to be successful in that environment? Uh, Brown and from what you're saying and you know and that's really just to to reach out stay current stay stay curious as you said um, and make sure that we are um, you know we're doing our best to stay current and and ready for our flexible situation so thank you thank you all for that um, I wanted to turn our discussion over to maybe some some tougher conversations that we we may or we may anticipate needing to have around um, you know, asking for a flexible situation or working in in more remote um, environments. And Ebony, if I could start with you, um, if say we're we're not fully comfortable about why we want or need flexible hours, how do we negotiate that conversation with our current employer? How to negotiate? So, I think the first step to do is to arm yourself with the information. And by that, I mean, find your, your company's policies, HR probably has them, and read them thoroughly. Because I, especially since, you know, many of us have been working remotely for the better part of three years now, <laughs> um, your HR department has likely added policies or information about what constitutes remote work, um, hybrid work, and just other policies around communications, attendance, all of that. So arm yourself with that and then make a plan for yourself. And what that means is if you understand what your employer expects of you and you know what you need, you need to figure out a way to bridge that gap. And so for instance, if, um, if your employer requires, um, let's just say they require you to put certain things in writing at periodic places, maybe typing is not your strong suit. Maybe you might need to use a voice typing tool to be able to meet those demands. If you need um, certain accommodations, like you have a disability or your life has changed in a way that um, requires flexibility, you have to have a plan in place that allows you to meet their expectations, but still allowing you to actually meet them. And so chances are your employer is gonna look at you like, well, how can you do this? You don't want to unnecessarily leave doubt in their minds about your ability to do the job. So you come up with a plan that is suited to your, to your abilities and to your needs and understands where you need to be and bridge that gap with the plan. And then you talk to your supervisor um, about what you need. If it's not something that requires an enormous shift in your responsibilities um, or in the way you approach your responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And if you're not comfortable with that, you can go to HR first. 
remember, you've already done the research and looked into the policies. So you have an expectation of what they might say. But if you have a plan, you can actually have a conversation that could actually be really fruitful for you. I love that, um, especially the part where you said, you know, plan for their main question. How are you going to get the job done and then develop that that tangible action plan? So I think that's some great advice. Thank you very much, Ebony. Don, if I could turn to you and, and ask you, you know, what we can expect to see as most of us um, begin to transition or emerge uh, from COVID. What are we starting to see from hiring managers with respect to flexible hours? and? How would you negotiate for a flexible schedule during job search? Sure. Um, maybe I'll take the second part of that question first. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so I have a brother-in-law who made the transition. He's a, he's a, he's a lawyer by professional uh, training, and he used to work at a big law firm, and he made the switch to work um, at a at a at a financial institution, right? So in a way, sort of going in house with a new strategy, and so he, he used to live in the city in New York City in Manhattan, and then he bought a house and moved all the way out pretty far in Long Island. Uh, and I think at first he thought that the commute was bearable, and then he did it once or twice and realized how much he absolutely hated the commute. And so prior to him making that switch, he went into that conversation pretty well equipped and armed. Um, as to what was important to him um, and what, you know, basically were must-haves and certain items where he could be flexible on. So again, in the theme of being strategic going into, into, into that conversation during the hiring process, interview process, it really is, a, it literally is a neg negotiation, right? So, um, and just keep back pocket the things you can give away to sort of make the other person feel like they're actually gaining something, but having that line in the sand where, you know, these are must have. So for him, and I'm just using this as an example, um, he needed to be in a situation where he would come into the office not more than once a week, right? Um, but to, to have that additional leverage, he ensured that the niche position that he was interviewing for, he was the ultimate candidate for it. So the company, needed to have him and his particular skill set um and you know to find a replacement for him was an uphill battle so one so he already had the leverage right going into that conversation because his skill set his experience set was certainly highly coveted so that's one too um he also demonstrated that um he was actually more productive right um if he could avoid an hour and a half commute each way um coming into the city right because in that hour and a half he can go through you know what i well you know he can be just in, in, incredibly productive right to the company and that was something that was certainly uh valuable to the company particularly in the for the role that he was going into which is a new a new strategy for them um so that's item number two item number three he also demonstrated that working at home not only was he uh more productive uh, because uh, avoiding the commute, but he also had the, the the safeguard mechanisms in place to make sure that his intellectual property of not his, but the firm's intellectual property would not be compromised, right? So he was in a safe, secure environment where he would not be distracted by ambient noises or just ambient or uh, stimuli, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so those were the items that were important to the employer. And he did his homework ahead of time, got that intel, he was were very well strategically focused such that he had the upper hand in the negotiation. Um, so it, it was a win-win for him. So I'm just using that as a, as a primary example as to how to go into, you know, how to navigate and tackle that whole process to come out on, on top while also making your employer feel that they're also, you know, um, getting a good deal out of the, out of the bargain. Um, and so coming out of COVID, what do employer employers expect? They certainly expect folks to come back into the office. I don't think they expect folks to come back on a full-time basis. Again, it depends. It really depends on you, who you work for. In my current capacity, I have the unfortunate luck of working for a very old school banker who needs me to effectively, you know, be a sounding board for every thought that he has. So I have to be in the office five days a week. Um, but it is what it is, right? So, um, so really, I don't mind that because um, uh, it, it works for me. Um, but for, for other folks, you know, especially if you already have a pretty tenable position where you don't want to completely give up 
you know, some level of hybrid remote uh, flexibility, I think that, you, you know, you should voice that. You should certainly mention that. Again, I know there are lots of different folks on this on this particular uh, forum in different, you know, industries and uh, uh, type of settings. I'm just speaking from a general office business environment, right? So talk to it, speak to it, uh, mention it, be vocal about it, but then also utilize some of the texts and tactics that we spoke about at the outset, right? So be over-present, over-communicate, over-deliver. Um, and one of the drawbacks of actually remote work that I found for myself during COVID is because you're working from home, because you don't have that hour and a half commute from Huntington, you know, Long Island, people expect you to be plugged on at like 7.30 in the morning. They will start pinging you. And then 11, 12 p.m. at nighttime, they also expect to reach you, right? So you also might want to also set, set some boundaries um, while also communicating that, hey, I'm, I'm available if you need me, but I need to put my kid to sleep at 8, 8.15, 8.20, 8 8.30 in the evening. So um, just, just some thoughts. No, I think that's great. And um, you you set us up perfectly for our next question around boundaries, but um, I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. Um, my experience is very similar, Don, where, um, you know, reemerging from, from, you know, the depths of the pandemic, you know, my employer too is expecting people to be in the office uh, more than before. And it does become a negotiation with your manager. Um, assuring them, allaying any concerns um, that they may have that you would not be accessible, even though you have demonstrated <laughs> that you have been over the last two to three years, but also being prepared to, um, you know, for myself, I'm prepared to go in if we're having any big workshops or any big meetings. And I just, you know, work to plan that ahead around childcare or travel or what have you. Um, so I think those are some really great tips. And you know, you bring up the the issue of boundaries. A, a lot of my colleagues who are, you know, work in Europe, and it is not uh, uncommon for me to wake up and my inbox is already full. Granted, I've I've managed to not, um, you know, to manage that like mentally and not worry about that. But one thing I do, uh, I do actually have to speak to is, um, you know, seven a.m. meetings, um, and and just being comfortable and pushing back on that. So. Brown, and if I could, if I could turn to you, um, you know, what tips do you have to create healthy boundaries in a remote or hybrid setting? And um, I'll start with that question because I think that's pretty common. Thanks, Nadine. Um, it can be so easy to let your boundaries, uh, your personal and your professional boundaries, slip when you're working remotely, and it's really important not just for you but for your colleagues to um, to set. Uh, to set some boundaries. It's healthy. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the concept of managing up, right? Um, you have to make your boss understand and comfortable with the fact that you're working remotely. So most of the collaboration tools, email, Slack, Teams, um, all of them have a status indicator, right? And a status message. And a lot of people, when they first see that status mess, uh, that status indicator, they see that little green light, their first reaction is, oh my God, this is a horrible intrusion into my personal, uh, into my personal life because now everyone can see when I'm online. But I'm telling you that your status indicator is your best friend when it comes to setting boundaries because when that you you can train your colleagues and yourself and your boss when that little dot is red it's red and you're not at work when that little dot is green you're ready to go and if if you can be consistent with making sure that those status lights are really representing um, your availability it's it's going to make your life so much easier you can you can leave work in half a second, you just turn your little dot red and you're gone. Um, so, but you can't do that if you're not consistent about it, right? <laughs> so if, you, if you're not keeping your calendar up to date or you forget to set your out of office um, on all of those platforms, um, it doesn't work as well. It works much better if, um, if you can, can be consistent in that way. Yeah. So your supervisor knows when you're there and when you're not, and everybody else does too. And even you know. 
<laughs> no, I, I think that's great. And I, I think it is important, as you said, to to feel comfortable setting those boundaries. And like you said, just be consistent with it. And um, uh, things should things should work fine. Um, the other question I had for you was around, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm sure that um, a lot of people on this call may feel this way. But how do you how do you manage like computer or specifically on camera fatigue? Sure. Yeah, it's a it's a real thing, right? If um, some people find it very exhausting to look at themselves. <laughs> on the screen all the time uh, that's totally legitimate uh, but you can change your teams or your zoom view so that your your options so that you don't have your own uh, camera so you're only looking at your colleagues uh, I think that's one good tip um, I also think that in the same way that uh, that you used to we used to be advised to um, you know to dress up right? And when you go to the office, put on, make a little effort, uh, not necessarily for any reason other than you want to communicate to your colleagues that, that you feel like what you're doing is important and what they're doing is important. And you have made the effort to present yourself in a way that communicates that. It's the same thing online, right? You, you can think about the space that you've given yourself to be on camera, to be online. Do you like that space? Do you like the way it work, it looks? Um, you know, is your camera angle flattering? <laughs> um, not up your nose, you know? <laughs> uh, and, and make that, like tailor that space for you and for your comfort level. Uh, I think that helps a lot. Um, and last of all, I would say that it is okay to say to your colleagues, look, I'm not feeling very well today. I would like to have my camera off. Uh, I apologize, but I'm here. I'm listening. I'm engaged. I just don't feel like I can have my camera on today. That is okay. Just be upfront about it and people understand because it affects everyone. We all feel that way sometimes. No, I think that I think that that's right, and and feeling comfortable and just sharing that. I think you're you'll find your colleagues probably feel the same way, um, you know, more times than than uh, not. Um, but I think with the technology and with the you know working remotely or flexibly, we do feel like we are just sitting in front of the computer all day. <laughs> so um, how do you how do you manage that type of fatigue? A standing desk is great. I'm using one right now. Uh, you know, get up, get down. Uh, you can you can do a lot of different things to uh, to combat the physical fatigue. Get a fatigue mat um, for your standing desk. It's great if you have one in your kitchen. You know how good it is. Um, and uh, you know the usual. This it's the same things that we discussed when we were in the office. So you have to set a timer sometimes to get up and get a drink of water. Uh, sitting is not good for us, as we know. Um, so just really be be conscious of um, moving your body. I think that's I think that's really great. It's a great thing to remember because I, I I do remember being in the office and sometimes saying, "Oh my goodness, I haven't left my office in X amount of hours." Uh, and maybe that even applies more so when you're when you're at home. Um, so thank you very much for that. And before we get to um, questions from the audience, I was wondering if. Um, all of you could speak to um, what you found to be the most rewarding about working remotely. I know for myself, I obviously I love the flexibility. Uh, I think it, it, it works better with my, my circadian rhythms. I can get up early because I have to and I can knock a lot of stuff out, which maybe leaves my afternoons a little bit more flexible, spend time with my daughter. I mean, heaven forbid, a hobby or two um, and, some, and some other interests. Uh, so I've really, I've really enjoyed that uh, aspect of working remotely. Um, Ebony, what do, you, what do you find most uh, rewarding? I think that the most rewarding things go into two buckets, the things that I gain and the things that I lose. I lose a lot of um, unfortunate interactions, <laughs> microaggressions, um, people who say and do things that they really shouldn't. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But I also gain things like the ability to 
start dinner a little bit earlier. Um, the ability to, you know, um, take care of certain personal things. Like instead of like hiding in the lactation room, I can just be in my house <laughs> and, and take care of my family. Um, I get to, you know, work with my brain. Um, you know, I have ADHD and my brain sort of turns on at certain points and turns off at certain points. Well, now I know that when my brain is turned off, I can do something that requires less concentration. I can plan my day a lot better. And so because of all of these things that I lose and that I gain, I have a much better work-life balance. Because I know that, you know, if I just sat through three hours of meetings like I did yesterday, you know, I could go and take a half hour break in my kitchen and have a cup of Bustelo or something, you know, um, it's, it definitely improves the work life balance, especially um, because I have pretty decent boundaries most days. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think um, I think many would agree with you that it's um, it's benefited, you know, your general mental health, whether that's um, how you feel you're addressing your job or your ability then to work around things and, and still be able to do things at home. So thank you for that, Ebony. Don, I know you said that you're um, you're back in the office most days, but uh, what do you like about the flexibility of doing one or the other? Um, <clears throat> for me, it, it was uh, very personal. Um, you know, when COVID started, my son was, I think he was uh, just a little over two. So it actually gave me the opportunity because most times now, by the time I get home, um, he's either in bed or just about to go to bed. So I usually don't see him until the following morning, but kind of going through that experience for however long it lasts, it gave me the, gave me the opportunity to actually like, you know, spend some time with him, um, see him in those early pretty formative years, right? So that to me, that was the biggest uh, takeaway. But Ebony, to sort of leverage your, um, you know, the way you sort of position that, there are certainly pros and cons, to, you know, um, working 100% remotely, particularly in the COVID environment, we were just stuck at home. <laughs> because on one hand, I love my son and I love spending time with them, but trying to do Zoom calls, um, especially when you don't have, you know, the help that you would have um, otherwise, uh, it was pretty challenging. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, so you, you do lose some some uh, capacities of like, you know, just, um, you know, the banter with people at work, your colleagues. Um, and then for the work that I do, a lot of it is also experiential, meaning that you just learn by being you know, we call it the bullpen, like with, with your colleagues, right? Like you learn from others, other people learn from you. Um, so you lose a little bit of that. You can only gain so much of that through Zoom and Teams. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, again, I think life is about balance. So maintaining that good balance, you know, works. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, it's a good, it's a fair point about learning through seeing, seeing other people do it as well, um, and the benefit that that can bring to your career growth. Um, so I have the same question for you, Bruno, and, um, what do you most enjoy or find rewarding about working remotely? Well, I, I think a lot of people will share this with me. I don't love my commute. <laughs> it takes a lot of time. And the extra time I get back from not having to do that, I I love being able to spend it in whatever way I need to, you know, uh, even if it is more work, that's also good if I, if you love what you do like I do. So, um, but yes, more exercise, healthier food, cheaper food, to Ebony's point about the $14 salads, um, more comfortable uh, environment in some cases. Um, my kids are big, so, uh, I, I am trying to imagine what it would have been like having uh, a fully remote work um, environment when they were little, but uh, as it is, they're big. And, and um, so I do, I do like the, the, the quiet, you know, and it's, it can be a chance to focus. Um, I will say that having come back to the office 70% um, of the time at this point for me, um, I find that the contrast between being in the office and being uh, at home is really pleasant to me. Yes. And so now when I am home uh, on my remote days, it just feels so much more um, uh, 
amazing. I was like, wow, I get to work here. It seems like a treat. So um, I didn't feel that way when I was when I was there the whole time uh, right. in the middle of the pandemic, but now I do. Perspective is everything. Exactly. <laughs> No, that's true. That's that's great. And and actually, I feel that way sometimes when I go in because I'm I'm actually happy to uh, see some of my colleagues to catch up with some people that just my day to day work didn't you know didn't allow me to to speak to or catch up with. So I do really enjoy that um, when I do go in. And like you said, when I'm home, I'm like, okay, yeah, this is actually quite precious time. So um, again, wanting to be strategic about how I how I use how I use that time as well. So um, we have started to get some questions from the audience. I can't say I'm surprised about that. Um, the first one, I think I'll start with you, Ebony. And we, we, may, we, we may actually ask Don to, to chime in on this, but Ebony, what are some of the skills we can learn to highlight on our resume when applying for remote or flexible jobs? I think that you have to think about the how and not just the what you're doing. So for example, um, I frequently work with people in different time zones. So, you know, I might highlight something like, um, like I work with people across six time zones, for example. Um, right, right. You just think about what it takes to accomplish something. And those are more than likely skills. If you think mm -hmm. about the how and not so much the what. So, I mean, like you can send emails at any time of day, right? But if you're in a position where you need something from someone, like I used to work with an editorial team a production team in um India and I would have to send things to them and then I would have to wait until they accomplish their stuff that's planning ahead that's also communicating so you you have to sort of reverse engineer how you do things in order to be able to pull out what the skill is and then you can dot it down so you know collaborating across time zones um managing expectations is a big one um think about how you manage expectations do you plan your calendar do you um say like what my boss likes to say yes and yes i can do this and i can also you know handle it this way you you it's going to be unique to you and your work situation and the people you have to deal with and the tasks that you have to do so mm -hmm. think about the how yeah, no, I think it's a good point, and especially with our audience who have been through CUNY SBS, um, I mean, they used a lot of those skills um, in their education, right? So their ability to manage multiple projects and to lead initiatives, uh, uh, like you said, across different time zones. I think that that's, um, uh, you know, I think that that's great because it's already baked into to our audience here, a lot of those skills, but it is important, like you said, to speak to uh, how you how you manage to get things done. Don, anything to add there? I, I think Ebony hit it right on the head. I think it's um, you know demonstrating the different core competencies that you have. Um, you know, in the Army, we call it being tactically and technically proficient. So whatever capacity that is, just highlight it. And there are, <clears throat> I'm not a resume expert, but there are certainly uh, some catchy you know phrases and. Um, language that you can use to highlight highlight your skill set. Um, I, I think in this environment where people are all over the world, you know, all over the place, different time zones, different, you know, settings, also being able to lead and manage teams is super important. And, you know, making mention of that, again, using the right language, I think is, again, it depends on the role that you're applying for, right? And the seniority level. But even if you're a junior person, I think someone on the panel mentioned it earlier, you have to have, being able to manage up is so important, right? Especially if you're working for someone who's not that smart. Um, be, being able to manage up is super critical. Um, so I think highlighting your, problem solving leadership skill set um, and just, just being able to get stuff done is super critical. Yeah, no, you mentioned a, one one thing that I want to speak to Brian about, and and that's you, you know technical um, efficiencies or anything that you want to that you would recommend 
uh, to adding to your resume around your technical proficiency? You know, it's important to uh, understand, I think, today that a lot of resumes are selected by computer algorithms and they um, make uh, companies make use of keyword searching. Um, so if you're in the old days, your resume may have been very um, heavy in like full sentences and uh, and long descriptions. I think now we need to just be aware that a lot of a lot of our resume is being read by a computer and it's looking for keywords. Um, so one strategy is to look through uh, LinkedIn and look at the keywords that are included in job descriptions that you think you would be interested in and make sure that those keywords are on your resume. Oh, that's great. That's a great tip. Thank you so very much. We have another question. I'll read it first and then I'll assign it. I worked remote for a few months during COVID. 95% of my work can be completed remotely. My senior manager will not allow remote work. Any advice you can provide to convince her? I'll, I'll give you to the <laughs> <laughs> the reactions. <laughs> um, would you like to s start with any tips, Ebony? What would you, um, how would you advise this person? I think that it's important to document how well you're doing things, um, what you're doing, how well, you know, sort of build your own metrics um, to, I, I hate, I hate the phrase prove your value, but I think you know what I'm getting at. Um, that said, people leave managers before they leave companies. And um, some people truly do not know how to manage without someone physically being there in front of them. But that is a them problem, not a you problem. You have options. Mm -hmm. oh, I, think that's a, I think that's a good point. Anything to add, Don? tips to advice how she can convince her manager? Yeah, I mean, um, I'll, I'll take a slightly nuanced uh, approach to that. Um, a couple of things. One, well, you know, speak to that manager, try to decipher why he or she is, you know, opposed to some level of flexibility in terms of work and setting. That's one. Two, I'm also... Um, so I think the pendulum swings, right? And unfortunately, I think the pendulum has swung to where employees have lost a lot of leverage as we had relative to during COVID, right? So I mean, if it's a job that you don't really care much about, then you know you can just find something you know new to do that is more accommodative to your particular situation. Um, now that that's obviously easier said than done, right? Because of, of the challenging times that we're, that we're living in. But you know, if it's a job that you do care about, um, I just maybe just be realistic. And there are certain things; you, everything's subject to compromise, right? So you just have that dialogue and figure out something that works for both you and that manager. And I think once that dialogue is had, you probably, hopefully, come to some sort of understanding. Um, that works well for you know both parties, right? It could be a situation whoever asked this question could be like in a managerial role. And if you have juniors underneath you, probably don't help if you're working from home mostly and <laughs> juniors have no one to look up to, right? Um, I'm just making that up. I don't know what the situation is. Mm -hmm. um, or if you are a junior um, and, you know, yes, you can do your work 95% remotely, but Again, there's also that experiential learning aspect of it, right? So, and if you're not there in person, you're not learning. It's, you know, if you're not being part of the culture, the fit, when it comes time for promotion, times for pay, you'll probably get dinged. And, you know, again, my experience, right? People will look you in the face and smile while they ding you, right? So, 
Um, but yeah. <clears throat> yeah. No, I mean, Don, it's a, it's a, it's a fair point. I think um, even in my experience working at a, a fairly large organization, as I mentioned, most, um, you know, the expectation is mostly now that people are coming back to the office more days a week. Um, but to the points that you made and Ebony made, that may not be all of the hiring managers, right? So that's where you benefit from reaching out to your networks and talking to people. Um, you know, virtually and when you, when you're in in person and seeking out perhaps those more flexible hiring managers. Okay, Brown, I have a question for you. What websites or resources should be used when searching for remote jobs? And how can I get training on remote work skills? So let, let's do the first one first. Um, what re websites or resources um, should be used when searching for remote jobs? Uh, LinkedIn is really um, an, an incredible resource uh, for searching for jobs as well as, um, you know, training. <laughs> LinkedIn learning is, is terrific. Um, the, uh, you know, there's, there's all the job sites. There's Indeed, there's um, this Monster is still around. Um, uh, you, you can easily Google them. Um, I would caution you, though, if you sign on to too many of those, uh, your inbox will become full uh, of uh, solicitations from those companies, and and some a lot of those are scams. So um, you should look to see if the industry that you want to work in has its own job board. Many of them do. Um, in the in the um, in the not-for-profit space, in the performing arts space, and in higher ed, um, all of these uh, have have special uh, job boards that you should have a look at. Um, also, I think it's can be really effective to skip all of those job search places and go straight to the places you want to work. How do you figure out what those are? That's that's kind of a different project. But every, these days, every company website has an employment link on it somewhere on that page, usually after, under the about. Find that, look at the listings, um, and pick, your, pick where you want to work and, uh, and pursue those opportunities. No, that's great. And how can I get training on remote work skills? Um, I know I've said this a few times. There's a really terrific LinkedIn learning uh, video that, that goes through remote work skills um, that I can include um, in, in the links that, I, that we'll be sending out later. Um, I, I don't know of any specific training opportunities, um, like in a traditional sense for remote work skills. I think what you're doing now, attending this, right. this panel is a really great right. option. There's the fact that you're here, right. um, you're going to learn, but you know, you might also look for mentors, um, look for people who are already doing it. I just, People are flattered to when you ask them how they do what they do sometimes, oftentimes, you know, it don't try not to be shy. Try to try to get past uh, your shyness. Go straight to being bold and say, how do you do it? Oh, I think no. that's a great. I think that's a great um, tip. Um, and yeah, people are happy to share what works for them. And um, and also for me, I, I try not to see it as something that's so separate from what I was doing or anyone was doing previously, right? It's, it's, it, you're still organizing yourself, you're still managing your project, you're still keeping your workers and your managers informed on progress. You're just perhaps using different tools um, to, to do so. So I think that's great. And um, another question for you, Brown, and I'm not surprised uh, that there are a lot of tech questions here, but this question is around, um, the perceived difference between email and now all of the different communication tools that are available. And, and is email seen as being old fashioned and we should strictly, um, you know, move to these slick communication tools or um, is there room for both? So I would not say that email is old fashioned, but there is a shift in attitude toward email where email has become the more formal platform um, in some cases, I guess project management tools would be even more formal than email. So uh, I think you could think of them as 
formality levels. So project management tool is at the top because everything's documented there. It's, it's available for everyone in the project to see. And you really do want to make that a, a communication of record, right? Next down is email, something that maybe doesn't need to be documented as part of a project, but it does need to be documented or you want it to be part of a public record. Um, and then next down would be the chats, right? Uh, the collab tools, Slack and Teams. Um, this is <laughs> this is where you find out if your colleague wants to go have coffee tomorrow or if they saw that one thing on that one uh, news site. You, if, if it's something that doesn't have to live in perpetuity, put it on your collab because people do get frustrated uh, with long email threads that are like, what do you think? What do you think? Have you seen this? Did so-and-so go there? Are you available then? These kinds of casual conversations um, don't fit very well in, in email, frankly. No, I think and that's good. I, th I think that's a good point. And as usual, um, we should know our audience, right? Um, just, you know, you, yes. be, mm -hmm. be cognizant of, of who it is that you're communicating with, how, what's the best way of getting the information or the response that you need from them and, and go accordingly. Um, so I have a, another question here um, about networking and making uh, connections online. Ebony, um, how do you network? Well, um... For my day job, um, I often set up, you know, the little coffee things with um, my colleagues. For um, my business, which is remote, um, sometimes I use LinkedIn. Um, sometimes when I reach out to prospects, um, whether or not the relationship works out, you know, a couple of times a year, I just reach out to people and say, hey, you know, how is that project going? How are you doing? You know, did you enjoy the holidays? Things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to do that because that way you build a relationship instead of just reaching out to people when you want something, which is borderline tacky, depending on how you <laughs> think about it. Um, so I, you know, since I work fully remotely, um, in all aspects of my work, I do have to be proactive about it. You know, sometimes I'll just go on LinkedIn and see how um, my colleagues from three jobs ago are doing, <laughs> or, you know, I'll interact with um, something that someone has posted and sometimes I'll look people up. Um, I would advise though, if you're looking into, um, if there's someone that you've, seen only on social media and you don't have a relationship with them yet and you would like one or don't ask to pick people's brains people hate that um find out what they are about with the content that they've already posted first and then reach out with a connection point because otherwise people will just especially people who protect their time they'll just be like well i have all of these resources available that you haven't bothered to you know, engage with. So why should I talk to you? So the the way to um, make it meaningful is to find that point of connection. And you're not only going to, you're not going to find that until you've actually tried to engage with their content, um, or at least find someone who is willing to offer an introduction. That's another way to do it. No, I think that's, that's great. And Don, anything that you would add about how you network or make connections online? Um, online. Um, I personally, um, I struggle with that. Um, it, I mean, yeah, to, 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 to originate new connections online, I, it's something that I am absolutely horrible at. <laughs> well, so how about just general networking? Cause I think that that's, that's important regardless your, your work environment. Yeah, no, uh, just general networking. Um, I, you know, I think Ebony's one hundred percent right. It's for finding the points of connectivity and actually um, having a, a genuine interest to actually get to know that individual um, or groups of individuals or organizations, as the case may be, 
try to get to really know them as they are and know like as an end on an individual basis and you can find different points of connectivity right i mean for me usually it starts like you know talking about like schools kids schools you know living situations what have you because everyone sort of in that boat going through that um right. particularly the same age range right we're at that age where you're thinking about do i stay in you know in the in the city do you move to the burbs you think about what kids you know, your kid, or what schools your kids are going to go to. It's always a nice way to just kind of relate to those people um, outside of, you know, just like the professional, um, 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 uh, you know, things that you're there to discuss. Um, <clears throat> but that's in a work setting. Outside of a work setting, again, it's same same themes, um, really just trying to get to know that individual on a personal basis to the extent that they let you in, right? Um, so I think that's always great. And then Ebony, you're absolutely absolutely correct. Maintaining that connectivity once you've actually connected the first time, just nurturing that in some capacity. So, you know, my wife is really good about sending out like holiday cards, right? So um, it's, uh, you know, I'm always like, why do we do this? But it actually pays tremendous dividends um, to just take that picture and just send it around. Uh, people actually care and some people do keep it. Um, speaking of email, just checking on, on folks occasionally. Um, I'm not really very active on social media, but, you know, when channeled in the right direction, it's actually great to just check in on people on Facebook or whatever the latest thing is. Um, probably just to age myself um, and just figure out, you know, just to check in on folks and see how they're doing. But I think at the crux of it is just really maintaining that personal connectivity and actually prioritizing and making making some time to do that. Um, so, yeah, networking, it's hard, but it, it actually does take some work. Yeah. Um, and if you're someone like me who I'm not quite an introvert, I'm not quite an extrovert, I just know what I need to get done and I go get it done. So yeah. to me, it's like, this is my objective. I have to go get it done because one, I genuinely have an interest in two, there are you know, uh, ramific ramifications, both positive and negative, but mostly positive of just staying in touch with folks um, and uh, and uh, and making sure they know you, right? Um, and then the other thing too is, um, I'm not sure if we talked about it, but so I think someone mentioned mentor, getting mentors. Mentors are great. I Mentors, it depend, depends on who the mentor is. It's never really worked for me. I think having a sponsor is really what you need, right? It doesn't matter what organization you're in. A sponsor is that person who will like bang on the door when, you know, when conversations are being had around promotions and it, behind closed doors, that sponsor will bang the table and say, this is my guy or gal. I want you to bring him or her into the, that, that next level, right? So, it, so it, particularly if you're working remotely, you need a, a sponsor, right? And so prioritize your network and be strategic, find that sponsor or groups of sponsors. And the way I found that, particularly when I was in big organizations like I'm Morgan Stanley, join affinity groups. So for me, I was in the veterans network. And usually you find that senior person who, you know, will know people, right? That sponsor will pick up the phone and call your group head and say, hey, I need this person to get promoted. I need you to pay. You know what I mean? So like find that sponsor, network in that capacity. And that sponsor will actually in turn introduce you to other folks, right? And these are like senior folks who can actually move the card in your favor. Um, so just, you know, just some tactics that yeah. I've found. I think that's happen. great. No, and I'm so happy that you mentioned sponsors, uh, finding sponsors at work. I think generally networking in its various forms is an investment. Um, and you need to to plan and be purposeful about it, but uh, obviously very worthwhile, regardless of what avenue that you take online or in person. So with that, we are at time. Thank you to all our wonderful speakers and to our audience for your thoughtful questions. I hope you enjoyed the discussion this evening and are able to walk away with some best practices for any work environment. I know I have. <laughs> That concludes our event. Thank you so much again for attending. Please stay safe, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.